Hi folks, I am here to talk to you about the Unreal Editor for Fortnite. Now that last word can be something of a sticking point for folks, simply because you want to make your games, not ours, right? And so what I am here to do today is tell you, you can, as I retreat over to my slideshow. So this is obviously a bold statement, but what I am saying is that you can take UEFN and build entirely new games and entirely new genres while still using Fortnite's backend, Unreal's awesome tech, and the larger Epic ecosystem. Which makes this slide, honestly, a little glib. Because in reality, Fortnite may have entered the world as a third-person shooter, but it's a racing game, it's a survival game, it's a comedy club. It's all the cool stuff coming out of the creative and UEFN communities. So there really is a lot there. And when we at Epic push out those boundaries, what we want to do is really bring you with us and provide the information and technology necessary, which is why I'm here, and it's why I made a game. What game? This game. So what I did was build a exploratory maze shooter, kind of a classic retro genre, then upgrade it with both modern rendering tech, because it's unreal, we want to look pretty, and also modern movement tech, meaning sliding, mantling, jumping, sprinting, all the stuff that you couldn't traditionally do in these sort of games to open up the tactical options of the player. Beyond that, I use SceneGraph prefabs, I use camera and control devices, I use the NPC spawner, and I use Verse Magic to title together using a bunch of new UEFN hotness. And we'll get into that in a sec, but before we do, I kind of want to talk about where it came from. So this is the Talisman demo. You probably saw it at State of Unreal. This was an internal epic project to see how far we could take UEFN. Metahumans, cloth simulation, amazing environments, gorgeous art. All of that, and I looked at that and said, it's amazing, but what could I as a solo or small team dev do with it? So I took a small subset of their assets and I made a thing. And now let's jump over to the thing I made and talk about how I made it. So here we are in the void of infinite creativity. And in that void is some assets I borrowed from my good friends at the Talisman demo by grabbing them from their Perforce. And I'm going to use those to assemble a scene graph prefab. So a scene graph prefab is, as the name describes, it's a scene graph, meaning that it is a hierarchy. And it's a prefab, meaning it contain, it, you can use it over and over again, and it consists of entities. I created a prefab entity definition, which is this. It's hierarchical, you can stack your entities, or you can have them in whatever order you want. An entity is above act, actor in the overall Unreal Engine hierarchy. So it's lighter, it's more efficient, it has less baggage, and Thus, it's very, very usable. However, if you want to add functionality to it, all you have to do is add a component. So I'm going to add some static mesh components, if I could spell. Static mesh component. So all I am doing is dropping in a couple static mesh components on these entities I have. Let's zoom out a little bit. And I'm going to turn this first one into the base of my floor. So this is the base of the floor. It is a static mesh. I'm going to adjust it. You can see these are. It's hierarchical, so those cubes rotated too. And now I want the AI to use it for navigation and so on. So I'm adding an AI navigation component that also adds a physics component that adds collision to the mesh. You can add the physics component without the AI, obviously, but because it wants to be helpful, it's helping me. These other two are just, I just need static meshes. I don't care about collision. So I am going to add a little bit of geometry just to, you know, detail it out a bit. There we go. And there you have a prefab. Now, so far, so blueprint actor, right? But with entities. So the fun part comes when I say, did you know that the prefabs are also entities? Meaning, rather than just building out a floor, I can do this. I can add a floor prefab. I can add a wall prefab. And I can add another wall prefab. And then suddenly, I have a corridor existing in a prefab with nested prefabs, meaning each of these, the walls and the floor, are all prefabs I built. Even those have nested prefabs, like these pillars. And then at each stage, not only can I nestle them within my entity, scene graph entity, which if you ever tried to nestle a blueprint actor, you know is significantly more complicated than what I'm doing here. I can also override any of the settings, meaning if I update the base prefab, I, the bit that's overridden will not get updated. So I could say, change the transform on this, I could alter a lot of stuff. There are things way beyond static meshes in here. There's verse, there's lighting, there's logic. You can build a ton of stuff in there and then override it as an as needed basis. So at this point, you may notice I have a couple more prefabs that I maybe let on. I have all of these. 
This is the tile set I used to build my game, and that is thin corridors, wide corridors, junctions, turns, rooms, all of that stuff. And it was all built with two walls, because this is just the same wall but reversed. Two walls, a door, and a couple bits of floor and a pillar. That was it. And that got me all of this stuff, all existing within SceneGraph prefabs. Now, if you were, say, doing a proc gen dungeon game, you could build all your tiles for your dungeon as prefabs, use Verse to stitch them together, and then potentially even save out the seed using Verse Persistence, which I'll get to a little bit later. However, I went in a different direction, and I call this prefabception, which is, this is my entire level layout as a prefab, meaning I nested about six layers deep prefabs to create an entire level layout, override the things I needed to override, all of that within prefabs, I can just drop them in a level and it works. And then I collected a bunch of assets to detail it out with from the ecosystem, borrowed some Niagara VFX and a really nice fog material from Talisman Demo, again, thanks folks, and this nifty asteroid field particle mesh system and built something. So as I like to say, Every game designer has a space dungeon in them. This is mine. Welcome to my space dungeon. And this is it. that prefab detailed out. I placed some props. Most of the lighting is hand-placed. Most of the atmospheric is hand-placed because I wanted it to be non-uniform. However, the doors have lighting and VFX components in the prefab because I want doors to always be lit up as a beacon for the user. So here is this environment. Looks real cool, right? However, if I was to play it, it would look a bit weird because while we have a top-down environment, we have third-person game, character, camera, and control, meaning who do you embody in the environment, how do you perceive the environment, and how do you navigate and interact with it. So right now I'm just using Fortnite's default ones. Obviously that doesn't work for us, right? So let's go back and see what we can do about that. Hide my cool spaceship and suddenly we can see that for camera, I am using the fixed angle camera device. This device, as the name says, lets you set up a fixed angle. It will track the player from that angle. It's highly configurable, meaning you can set, well, one, what angle it is from behind, from above, my three-quarter view. You want to do a side scroller. You can do all of that with this. You can set how it transitions, how it deals with collision, what its dead zone is, all of that. And most importantly, you can have multiple cameras. What that means is you could have also have, say, a fixed point camera. We've also just added an orbit camera that's not on this slide. But fixed point camera is, as it says, it's in a fixed location. You can set it to track the player or not the track, track the player. It's entirely up to you. I'm tracking it here in this example. But with that, you would want multiple cameras so you can keep tracking the player across the map. Because there is a priority system for the camera and they're event driven, it is very easy to set up a multiple camera setup. However, there's still a problem. That problem is I am viewing the world from up here and controlling my player from down here which breaks my brain. It does, doesn't work right. So what I want to do is write some camera relative controls. If you were a gameplay engineer or a tech designer like me, you know writing camera relative controls can be incredibly painful. It's a lot of work because you, what you want is no matter which way the camera's facing, you press up, you move in the direction you want. You want to move up. In this case, it was really hard. I dropped in this device third person then I configured it a bit, and then I got camera relative controls. That's it. That's all you need to do in UEFN. It's fully configurable. It's event-driven, just like the other one, but it gives me camera relative control, lets me set how I want to set player facing, meaning in this case I'm movement facing, lets me optimize how the player moves for top-down movement in this case, set targeting assistance because a third-person game has a lot more accuracy than a top-down game generally, and so on. So that is cam camera and control. Character... I just used the class designer device. It's been with UEFN since UEFN launched. It lets you create a customized character per player versus per team, which is really, really useful. So I created a class with the exciting name of Space Person and then completely overrode the Fortnite player to basically add all the movement tech I wanted, speed them up, make them turn faster, give them a custom inventory, fast reloading, make them much squishier because it's a different kind of game. And I'm not going to go into great detail on that because this is a relatively old device at that point. But camera, control, character. All done in about five minutes, basically. And then just tuned until it felt right. So if I was to run around this cool environment now, I would have the controls, I'd have the cool environment, but I'm making a top-down shooter with nothing to shoot. So let's talk about AI a little bit. Now, I'm going to turn on my AI stuff now. 
What you see here is the creature spawner. This is the most simple of our AI spawners in UEFN. I'm going to talk about that first because it lets me illustrate some points. What you see is that radius is the max spawn distance of what I'm spawning. However, there are two other numbers with any spawner you need to think about. Activation distance, meaning how far away the player is before they start spawning, and despawn range. Because if you are generating a ton of entities like I am, you want to clean up after yourself, right? So what you want to do is set a despawn range so there aren't just like guys running around the corners of the map taking up performance. It makes things better. It's the equivalent of turning off shadow casting on your lights to optimize performance. It's just a smart thing to do. So what I did from there is I had to customize these entities because a creature spawner only spawns predefined entities that are from Fortnite. So to customize them, I will welcome you to my corridor of dubious gentlemen I call down here. Oh, my scrolling went away for a sec. So these are creature managers. These are simple override devices that let me override the settings of these creatures to make them more squishy, more, con more like friendly for a top-down shooter than rather than a third-person shooter. However, none of this is especially beyond Fortnite. Like this is creeping to the edges of Fortnite. We want to go beyond Fortnite, right? So let's go over to the NPC spawner, which is our newest, hottest spawner device. If you use the guard spawner, you probably have some idea of what this is like. The guard spawner spawns the Fortnite guard archetype, which has vision, it has hearing, it can use weapons, it has team behavior, it has patrol paths, all of that. This, however, does not spawn a specific archetype. It spawns from an NPC character definition. And so what I wanted to do was spawn in friendly guards to help out the player, so I created a character definition called friendly guard. What that lets you do is basically either take an existing archetype, like guard or wildlife, and significantly override it, or custom. You can author your own behaviors in verse. This is fully tutorialized. It's up on the Epic Developer community. I'm not doing that for this talk because I will totally run out of time. But you can write entirely new AI in verse, and then use an NPC character definition to bring it into your game. I'm not doing that. I'm customizing the guard because they had all the functionality I needed. And then beyond that, you can apply modifiers, either to your own one or to uh, an existing archetype I've applied. And that's just as simple as hitting a button and then adding a modifier. So I overrode the health. I put them on the player's team. I did a UI modifier, so you can see their name. They have a nameplate that says Friendobot, so they, you know, they know you're a friend. And then we get to some interesting stuff, which is the cosmetic modifier. I am using a Fortnite skin. They have a cool looking robot. I wanted a cool robot, but you can also custom character. So you can basically retarget your custom character to use the animation set and bring in your own custom assets to be AI within UEFN with custom behaviors should you so desire. I did not do that, but I could. And it is really, really powerful. So how does that end up looking? Well, it looks something like this. Friendobot spawns in, starts fighting enemies, backs up the player. And they're just running around doing Friendobot stuff. However, there is an additional thing I want to do. So let's jump back to the editor for a second. What I want is I want them to basically guard the player, not just appear and shoot stuff and be on the player's team, but actually guard them. So what I've done is I've added a verse tag markup device with a tag called spawner friendly that I defined in verse. So let's open up verse. Spawner friendly right there. That's all you need to do. And then within my verse gameplay logic, which I like to show this off because I'm silly, but um, my gameplay logic is actually a prop in my level two. There is it, where is it? There you are. So this is my gameplay logic, it's a verse device. It's also a prop, it looks cool, why not? Um, and at this point, I can take you over to my verse and show you what I did. So I have that tag. What I do is I get everything with that tag and I throw it in an array. That creates an array of creative objects, which is the base object type. And then I iterate through that array and go, hey, are you an NPC spawner? If you are, I want to subscribe to your spawned event, meaning I spawn something and it will call this function I wrote called friendly NPC spawned. It passes automatically the NPC that spawned as an agent, which is the class that the NPC is in. So once I have that, I get the player. I'm being lazy, I'm just getting player zero, I'm making a single player game. If you're making a multiplayer game, don't just get player zero, it's not gonna work for you. And I am passing the player and that NPC that spawned to another function called NPC follow player. Why I'm using a second function here is it's a suspended function because I want a delay in there. 
So I wait one second, just because when something spawns in, I want it to sort of appear rather than just like spawn in running over. It looks really weird. So I give it a second delay, and then because I'm using the guard, they have a leashable interface, which says, hey, stay within this distance and this distance of a thing. That thing can be either a transform in the world or an agent. NPCs are agents, but so is the player. So all I'm going is, are you leashable? If you're leashable, leash to the player. This is your radius. This is your outer radius. And what that does is that gets you NPCs who leash to the player. When I show you the full playthrough at the end, you'll see that happening. One thing you might have seen in this slide is that I also have a combo scoring system. And the way that works is very simple. I have a timer device. Just like the NPC spawner, I am tracking my creature spawners. When one creature is eliminated, I just call a thing that scores points, but I also activate a timer. Every creature we eliminate while the timer is activated increases an integer. When that hits a certain value, I, add a, I increase your score multiplier. Timer expires, I decrease your score multiplier. What's really interesting is what happens at the end. So at the end of the game, I save out your high score for you as an individual player using verse persistence. To do that, I have this cool script here that manages my statistics. Confession, I didn't write this. I got it from one of our tutorials, copy pasted it into verse and modified it slightly. So if this looks intimidating, someone else really smart wrote it, you can just copy it. If you're a really smart engineer, you can totally do whatever you want with it. But for me, I just use a routine that goes, I'm gonna pass you a value. If it's higher than the value you're already storing, store that value instead, that's it. And what we do is we map that value to a weak map, which is how we store player data. You get two weak maps per player, each is 128K, which doesn't sound like a lot, but you can hold thousands of integers in there. You could hold player stats, you could have player transforms, all kinds of fun stuff. In my case, I'm just mapping one value. If you want to map multiple values, you construct a class containing all the values that you want to map and feed that to weak map instead. And then, I have a function called record player score that I call that basically checks to see if my higher score, if my score is higher or not. So back here at the very end of my game, when, every, when you reach the end game point, I have another suspended function with a slight pause just because I don't want the score to show up immediately. And then I get my player stats for the current player because each player has their own assigned stats. If they exist, because if it fails, this doesn't happen, then I do my record player score function, which just goes, hey, is this, is this higher than my high score? Okay, now this is the high score. And then I have two sets of output text based on whether you win or you lose, but all I'm doing is displaying a HUD message with your score and then the score I'm storing. That's it. I write it to the weak map and then I call the weak map and I go, hey, can I get the score maximum value? And it gives me that and I display it in a HUD message, which means that you at that point are saving out data. Let me show you that in action. So this is me in editor about to play the game. That's a cinematic sequence device controlling a spaceship. That's an objective device giving me directions to go to. So you can see me manhandling the spawner. Worth noting, I have music. You can barely hear it. I made it in patchwork. Patchwork is awesome. You should use it. You can see all that movement tech in terms of mantling, sliding, jumping, and so on. So I have tactical options. It's running really efficiently because I'm constantly despawning things you can't see. I slide shooting sideways there. It's my favorite bit. But yeah, you can see that I'm opening up this kind of game to a more three-dimensional perspective. It feels like there are a lot more enemies than there actually are because I'm doing some tricks. So here is Friendobots. Notice as I'm playing, the Friendobots pause and then start moving towards me. They are my bodyguards, they're defending me. However, I am way faster than them, so they follow me through the map a bit slowly. So I spawn a couple as I run through. Here's another one. As I push towards the end objective, the, my enemy counts get higher and higher until I hit this. This wall of enemies and Friendobot, who looks like he's retreating to help me, but in fact, Friendobot is just leashed to me and coming closer. I jump the enemies, leave Friendobot to deal with them because I'm a jerk, hit my objective, complete the mission. You can see it recording my high score right there, but I don't beat my high score. And I complete the mission. That's another cinematic sequence. My name is Sam Bass, and that was my talk. Thank you very much.